was reading Alice Walker's superb new book, a collection of powerful essays and speeches, the night before last. I was on a red-eye flight across the country, and everyone else, I assumed, was watching Talladega Nights. <laughs> At one point, I turned the page, and the woman in the seat next to me elbowed me and said, oh, please, could you please just wait before you turn the page? <laughs> of course, we introduced ourselves. Her name was Laura. I didn't realize it, but she'd been reading it over my shoulder, and she, and she was as riveted as I. Um, we are the ones we have been waiting for. Inner light in a time of darkness is the title. For the next hour or so, Laura continued to read over my shoulder, and I continued to wait to turn each page, and I'm not a fast reader. <laughs> we read together, and she vowed that she is buying this book for everyone on her Christmas, Kwanzaa, and Hanukkah list. We are the ones we have been waiting for is filled with tremendous knowledge, insight, and wisdom about every subject vital today, from war and famine to AIDS, pollution, and greed. On every single page, sentences and paragraphs zing at you, piercing your mind, your soul, and pressing you into action. Sentence, sentences such as this, There is much work to be done, sister and brother earthlings. And passages such as this, To begin our long journey toward balance as a planet, we have only to study the world and its peoples to see they are so like ourselves, to trust that this is so, that different clothes and religions do not create people who can escape from humanity. When we face the peoples of the world with our open hands and in honesty and fearlessness speak what is in our memories and our hearts, the dots connect themselves. Throughout time, the greatest writers have been the greatest thinkers of their day, with an uncanny ability to see the clearest path before the rest of us can. That is Alice Walker. We are blessed, honored, graced, and humbled to have her with us tonight, Georgia's own literary and intellectual treasure. We are so grateful that she chose Atlanta for her first appearance with this magnificent new title. Ms. Walker's book is filled with important information, critical advice, and I'm so happy to say, bright rays of hope. I believe this is the most important book ever celebrated by the Center for Southern Literature. <clears throat> Alice Walker won the Pulitzer Prize, the first for an African-American woman, as well as the National Book Award for her third novel, The Color Purple which was made into an internationally popular film, and is now, of course, a Broadway musical. Her other best-selling novels, which have been translated into more than two dozen languages, include By the Light of My Father's Smile, Possessing the Secret of Joy, and The Temple of My Familiar. Her most recent fiction work, Now is the Time to Open Your Heart, was published in 2004. Ms. Walker is also the author of several collections of short stories, essays and poems, as well as children's books. Her most recent children's book, There is a Flower at the Tip of My Nose Smiling at Me, came out in the spring of 2006. Her work has also appeared in numerous national and international journals and magazines. An activist, a social visionary, Ms. Walker has been a participant in many of the major movements of planetary change in the last half century, among them the Civil Rights Movement in the South, the Hands Off Cuba Movement, the Women's, the women's Movement, the Native American and Indi Indigenous Rights Movement, the Free South of Africa Movement, the Environmental and Animal Rights Movement, and the Peace Movement. Her advocacy on behalf of the dispossessed has, in the words of her biographer, Evelyn C. White, spanned the globe. I am so honored. Please let's give a warm welcome to Alice Walker.
problem with trying to um, get these things to do right, you know. Uh, they may or may, they may not. <laughs> so, hi. hi. I'm really, really happy to see you. I mean, just absolutely delighted to see you. It's wonderful. Um, and so many of you, too. <laughs> and so many of my family, which is just great. I just love seeing my family here. Yes, I love seeing you there. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Well, you had you had, you had taller people before. Buy me one of these. Okay. I'll make a donation. <laughs> how, about, how about just letting it. <laughs> anyway. Sorry. That's all right. These things happen. Okay. How is that? Can you hear me? Even if I start reading, because it's going to be a different slant when I start to read, but if you have problems, just let me know, and then our friend maybe will come and help us some more. <clears throat> I'm really happy to be back in Atlanta, because I was thinking today, I went to school here for a couple of years at Spelman. Are there any Spelman people here? Yay! And I was actually, I was actually thinking, you know, how much I appreciate the time that I spent at Spelman because I met so many incredible women, just really wonderful women, activists, scholars, uh, very sweet people, very um, determined people, because we were at that time trying to desegregate your lovely city so that now you can all be sitting here like you're sitting. You see, that's what we were doing. Uh-huh. So when I, when I look out at you, it's a very wonderful and heartwarming view because I know what we had before, which wasn't so happy. Uh, one of the women that I think of um, is here tonight, and that is um, my wonderful friend, Beverly Guy Sheftal. And we go back so far, Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal. Uh, we go back very, very far to uh, times when um, I don't know, I keep thinking about you know various confrontations I had to have when I was at Spelman and had to leave wonderful people like Beverly. I didn't want to leave you, but had to go. Um, and I was also thinking, though, about how great it was that Spelman was so close to Morehouse. Are there any people from Morehouse here? Well, that's very strange because um, I, when I was a fresh person at Spelman, I had, I had this crush on this wonderful Morehouse man uh, who later actually proposed to me, and we didn't actually go ahead and get married, but it was a wonderful friendship. And then I was in partnership with another Morehouse man for 13 years, and that was really wonderful. Uh, he had learned all of those qualities that we all wish all Morehouse men had. A, you know, a certain degree of courtliness, uh, punctuality, uh, all those wonderful things. And also because he had been brought up by his mother, mostly, he could make a sweet potato pie from scratch. <laughs> so this is really just, you know, it was pretty wonderful, actually, being that close. But the person, the, the man at Morehouse that I want to talk about tonight, uh, I met another man at Morehouse when I was a student, and that was, of course, Martin Luther King, Jr. And I'd like to talk a little bit and read to you about what that was like and where that um, goes in the story of our common life. Because he did represent, for all of us, something very special. Uh, and many of us have not really been able to deal with our grief uh, about his assassination. And so some years ago, I decided that it was about time to try to really write about this 
and to deliver a talk about it and to also put it on the radio because for his birthday I was not happy that all you could hear, generally speaking, was the I Have a Dream speech, which is a wonderful speech, but there are so many speeches, and there's so many thoughts, so many ideas, uh, just, just so much richness from his life. And also the richness of our response to his life, and how we have managed to carry on after his death. It has been an amazing, journey that we have undertaken to try to re regain our balance, to stand up again, and to move forward. And sometimes this has not been acknowledged, the depth of the grief. We look at our communities, and we know that it's true that our neighborhoods have been targeted and, and made the focus of guns, the deliveries of guns, and deliveries of cocaine and crack. We know that. We know that the CIA has been involved in that. So we feel all of that. But we also know that part of what we have been doing in some of these communities, even without having a clue that this was connected, what we've been doing is trying to medicate this horrible loss, this feeling of absolute abandonment and sorrow. We have not many of us had the, the, the period of time, after all these years, to grieve as deeply as I believe many of us have felt. So this piece that I'm going to read to you, and hopefully this will stay and I can keep myself in alignment with it uh, so that you can hear me. It is called, How It Feels to Know Someone Died for You living with the voice of the beloved. I want to talk to you about grief. And grief is something that often we just run away, away from. We feel like, you know, there's enough struggle and there's enough suffering. Do we actually have to deal with it? Well, the answer is, that, is really yes, you do. If you don't deal with it, it will get you anyway. So, when Martin Luther King Jr. died, I was living with my husband, a white Jewish civil rights lawyer, in one of the most repressive places on the face of the earth, the state of Mississippi. My sister once said that she was so afraid of the state of Mississippi that she didn't even want me to fly over it. <laughs> my whole family thought I was crazy to try to live there, to live there also with a white man, my marriage to him, according to the laws of the state of Mississippi, illegal. And I don't believe my sister has flown over the state of Mississippi or landed in it to this day. However, my husband and I were there to change it, to make it a place that black people who so deeply love the South, the seasons and the sun, could truthfully call home. I was pregnant when the news of King's assassination reached us. It had been his voice that urged both of us at separate times to return to the South to challenge the apartheid, apartheid of Mississippi. If not for his voice pointing out a duty it might have been safer to ignore, we might not have found each other, not to mention a large part of our life's work. Determined to follow Martin to the end, we traveled to Atlanta for the funeral. We walked behind his mule-drawn coffin for many miles. I lost the child. How much can two people weep? How much can two people weep? It is hard to know because we were so not alone among those who were weeping all around us. We remained in Mississippi for several years after King's death. Yet for me, the period following his passing represented a time of disbelief, of incredible loss, of unspeakable sorrow. Only in the South, I still believe, was he mourned as deeply as he deserved. Because as Southern-born people of color, we understood what a gift his life had offered us, his shining fearlessness. Only in the South did so many of us retreat in so profound a sorrow 
as to, have, as to appear to have been struck dumb. I could not bear to hear his voice for a very long time. And yet, there was a miracle also, again, especially among black Southerners. Even in our deep, deepest sorrow, the daily palpable ache of missing him, which never seemed to soften or to go away, we discovered a tender, radiant certainty that made some wretched, bewildered, stunned, and stupefied part of us begin almost to smile. We knew never not to know that he had died for us. We knew we had been seen, held precious and dear, beyond pain or price or sacrifice. We knew we had been completely loved. I firmly believe there is no wholeness for a people, no promised land in view until this happens, which is a pretty challenging thought. His offering of himself in love and faith was a forerunner of the promised land he would at the end of his life offer us. And yet, there were contradictions. In my novel, Meridian, which I wrote while living in Mississippi, being part of the movement for black liberation and also relentlessly observing it. There is a chapter called Free at Last, a day in April, 1968. In it, the heroine, Meridian Hill, a poor woman, attends, as I did, Martin Luther King Jr.'s funeral in Atlanta. And this is from the novel. Long before downtown Atlanta was awake, she was there beside the church, her back against a stone. Like the poor around her, with their meager fires and braziers against the April chill, she had brought fried chicken wrapped in foil and now ate it slowly as she waited for the sun. The nearby families told their children stories about the old days before black people marched before black people voted, before they could allow their anger or even their exhaustion to show. There were stories, too, of southern hunts for coons and possums among the red Georgia hills and myths of strong women and men, Indian and black, who knew the secret places of the land and refused to be pried from them. As always, they were dressed in their very Sunday best and were resigned on their arms, the black bands of crepe paper might have been made of iron. They were there when the crowd began to swell early in the morning, making room, giving up their spots around the entrance to the church, yet still pressing somehow forward with their tired necks extended to see just for a moment, just for a glimpse, the filled coffin. coffin. They were there when the limousines began to arrive and there when the family wounded crept up the steps and there when the senators running for president flashed by and there when the horde of clergy in their outdone rage stomped by and there when the movie stars glided as if slowly blown into the church and there when all these pretended not to see the pitiable crowd of nobodies who hungered to be nearer who stood outside throughout the funeral service, piped out to them like scratchy music, and shuffled their feet in their too tight shoes, and cleared their throats repeatedly against their tears, and all the same, hopelessly cried. Later, following the casket on its mule-drawn cart, they began to sing a song the dead man had loved. I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses. Such an old favorite and neutral. The dignitaries who had not already slipped away and now cursed the four-mile walk behind the great dead man opened their mouths in genial mime. Ahead of Meridian, a man paraded a small white poodle on a leash. The man was black and a smiler. As he looked about him, a tooth encased in patterned gold sparkled in his mouth. On the dog's back, a purple placard with white lettering proclaimed, 
I have a dream. Then she noticed it. As they walked, people began to engage each other in loud, even ringing conversation. They inquired about each other's jobs. They asked after each other's families. They conversed about the weather. And everywhere, the call for Coca-Cola for food rang out. Popcorn appeared, and along their route, hot dog stands sprouted their broad, multicolored umbrellas. The sun came from behind the clouds, and the mourners removed their coats and loosened girdles and ties. Those who had never known it anyway dropped the favorite song, and there was a feeling of relief in the air, of liberation, that was repulsive. Meridian turned in shame as if to the dead man himself. This a black characteristic man, a skinny black boy tapping on an imaginary drum was saying, we don't go on over death the way whiteies do. He was speaking to a white couple who hung on guiltily to every word. Behind her, a black woman was laughing, laughing as if all her cares at last had flown away. Martin Luther King Jr. had asked us to do something really hard. Many people felt he had asked us to do something impossible. He had asked us to embrace nonviolence as a way of life. When he died by the gun, for many, many people in the movement and out of it, there was a feeling of release. We can't do it, many felt. We can't live as nonviolently as Martin Luther King Jr. did. And once again, the white man, in the person of King's assassin, has demonstrated why. It was shocking to feel this. At the same time, it was completely understandable. I went through a period of being afflicted by horrible fantasies of blowing up terrorists, members of the Ku Klux Klan and the white citizens' councils, racist fanatics of all kinds who daily tormented and harassed us. And of course, blowing myself up with them since as a pacifist and a deep believer in nonviolence, I could never imagine murdering another without also murdering myself. This was a particularly bleak and dreary dark night of the soul. I survived it partly because of King's example. <coughs> Our communities did erupt in violence, many of them. Several went up in flames. The youth especially could no longer bear to consider nonviolence an option for changing the world. Guns flooded our neighborhoods, accompanied by the handiest painkiller, illegal drugs. Because it was pain, all of it, the rage, the laughter, the feeling of being relieved of a burden too noble for mere persecuted humans to bear. And underneath everything, the longing for the presence of the beloved, deeply, deeply missing him. The one who loved us and saw us and stayed with us, knowing he would not survive his blatant love for us, not survive his vibrant dancing life. There was a rumor when I was at Spelman College which is across the street from Morehouse, Martin Luther King Jr. School, that he was a terrific dancer. Some of the movement's tacticians, who also didn't want us to know a few of our leaders were gay, didn't want us to talk about this, I think because he was a preacher. This made it all the more amusing later when the planet discovered that J. Edgar Hoover the gay head of the FBI, <laughs> audio taped him doing more than dancing and apparently having an exhilarating time. I met him during that period of flying rumors. <clears throat> I was sent by my instructor in speech class to attend one of King's lectures and to write literally about how he spoke. We were warned to write nothing of his politics. That's the kind of school Spellman was at the time. <laughs> Even though students were risking arrest and being arrested, eagerly listening to Martin's every word, every day. After his talk, <clears throat> after his talk, he shook hands with each of us. He had been brilliant, mesmerizing. 
But since I couldn't write about what he said, I wrote about what he wore. <clears throat> a really neat gray suit. And talked about his accent, which I thought was pretty broad, pretty funny. Moving beyond belief, though, was the message of his speech. That by freeing ourselves nonviolently, we could also free our oppressor. Though it was an impassioned speech, he didn't seem particularly attached to it. This detachment was characteristic of him, I was later to observe. An old soul, he already appeared to have the overview of an ancestor. His was a deep love for humanity, and it was wonderfully, wonderfully impersonal. Curiously, this meant that his speeches were unfailingly electrifying, <clears throat> bringing his audiences to tears and laughter and spontaneous delight in the truth of his words, no matter how bleak. He was someone who, in a sense, was living consciously toward his death, which is how we black Southerners felt. Martin Luther King Jr. was not the only one who thought he wouldn't survive. Most of us thought he would be taken from us sooner. And yet, when he was no longer with us, knowing we shared this awareness with him, that he had known it too, hardly made the loss of him easier to bear. He feared no man, he said. He had been to the mountaintop, seen the promised land. He might not get there with us, he said, but we as a people will someday get to the promised land. What did this mean? Americans, and African Americans too, can be very materialistic. There are those who believe that because we can eat anywhere, sleep anywhere, buy houses and even airplanes almost anywhere, we have arrived at the promised land. Or, to be more accurate, they've arrived because there is still the huge problem of homeless people, sick and out of work people, the continued drugging of our youth and communities across the nation, plus the 1.2 million African American men in prison. Someone else has confessed to the murder for which Mumia Abu Jamal has been on death row for over 20 years. Jamal is still behind bars. This is more the land promised by Bull Connor and George Wallace, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and George Bush than the promised land seen by Martin Luther King. The promised land that King saw was the country of freedom and justice. In his speeches, he says this many times. How are we to get there? Just a few days ago, I visited Ground Zero in New York City. The people have done such an amazing, loving job of cleaning up the wreckage that it is difficult to imagine all the lives lost there. And yet, the people remember. They come, write messages, leave notes, flowers. Some of the faces of those lost on that day seem to me especially beautiful, peace-loving. I cannot imagine they would wish their own fate on anyone else. War will never make us safe. The only way to end it is by stopping. That is the power we have as a nation, as the most powerful nation militarily on earth. <clears throat> Imagine what that would feel like to the world if we said, instead of bombing small children, donkeys, and chickens that never heard of us, we could blow you to bits, we could pulverize you, but we won't. In fact, we are so strong that we are not afraid to listen to you. What is it you want to tell us that you thought we could not hear unless you went for our mommies and daddies? small children, 5,000 of them left without a parent in New York City, our donkeys and our chickens. Only if we can stop the terrorism in our own hearts will we be able to stop terrorism in the world. Remember who we are. We are a people for, some, for whom someone has died. We are a people who know what it means to have been seen, claimed, and beloved. This is a poem. Thousands of feet below you, there is a small boy running from your bombs. If he were to show up at your mother's house, 
on a green sea island off the coast of Georgia. He'd be invited in for dinner. Now, driven, you have shattered his bones. He lies steaming in the desert in 50 or 60 or maybe 100 oily, slimy bits. If you survive and return to your island home and your mother's gracious table, where the cup of loving kindness overflows the brim and from which no one in memory was ever turned, gather yourself, set a place for him. We are a people, African Americans, Amerindians, who have always welcomed the stranger. Perhaps this is the most enduring definition of the word indigenous, of the, true, of the truly civilized, or a word I prefer, cultured. It has cost us, and yet it is a surer path to the promised land of freedom and justice than is war. War is no creative response. This is another poem. War is no creative response, no matter the ignorant provocation, no more than taking a hatchet to your stepfather's head is, not to mention your husband's. It is something pathetic, a cowardly servant to base emotions, too embarrassing to be spread out across the destitute globe. The only thing we need to absolutely to leave behind crying lonely in the dust. And what we're leaving, mostly crying lonely in the dust now, is children. Remember who we are, precious, radiant, seen, beloved, and if they say your self-regard and love of earth and humanity is unpatriotic and a threat to the fatherland, America has become almost entirely masculine. Have you noticed? Offer this poem. Patriot, if you want to show your love for Americans, love Americans. Smile when you see one, flower-like, his turban rose pink. Rejoice at the eagle feather in a grandfather's braid. If a sister bus rider's hair is especially nappy, a miracle in itself, praise it. How can there be homeless in a land so crammed with houses and young children sold as sex snacks, causing our thoughts to flinch and snag? Love your country by loving Americans. Love Americans. Salute the soul and the body of who we spectacularly and sometimes pitifully are. Love us. Love us. Love Americans. We are the flag. The 16th century mystic and prophet Nostradamus foresaw a future 400 years ago that had someone like Osama bin Laden, a prince from the East bent on our destruction as a country, in it, and Cheney and Bush, and us, the masses of earthlings, trying with a bit of dignity and luck to get by. He saw the world engaged in war, including nuclear war, for 27 years. According to him, we are in for a period of incredible destruction. Because of famine and war, he said, people would begin to eat each other. I think of this when I hear reports about the people our military is bombing in Afghanistan, that they are starving and cold, that they are eating cakes made of grass. September 11th has demonstrated that America is not immune to the suffering of the world. Karma means we will not avoid reaping whatever we sow. It may well be too late. Martin Luther King Jr. said that these two words are perhaps the saddest in human language, too late. And yet, like him, I do not entirely despair. I like to think of the last night of his life. He'd been depressed, ill with a cold. He felt he couldn't speak to a crowd who had assembled to hear him. He sent someone else, his friend and colleague, the Reverend Abernathy, in his place. But Martin was sent for. The crowd wanted to hear him, no matter how sick he was feeling, and he went. 
It was that night that he told the world what he had seen, a promised land of freedom and justice for our people. After that speech, his cold seemed to disappear, his spirits brightened. One of the last acts of nonviolence Martin Luther King Jr. engaged in was a pillow fight back at the hotel with his associates. I love this image of him, laughing, throwing pillows. Let us take a moment to imagine him doing this. Let us take a moment to smile. Most of the photographs of King show someone very solemn, very serious, but he had a merry laugh and a beaming smile. He liked to hear jokes and enjoyed his own jokes. I think he was more like the Buddha than like the Christ image that has been handed down to us. Nostradamus said that after the destruction of this world, there would again be peace everywhere and that it would last a thousand years. I offer his words not necessarily for belief, because who among us knows the future, but for contemplation. If we must fight the poor around the world, let it be with pillows filled with food and blankets, houses, donkeys and chickens, heating fuel and real cakes made of butter and flour and eggs and chocolate. We can easily afford this. If the, war in, if, if the war in Afghanistan and Iraq costs us $35 million a day, we could feed and house everyone on earth who needs it for far less. We could even throw in violins and bicycles. Generosity toward those less fortunate is the way of the future, if a future exists. Who are we blessed with so much to be stingy? Remember who we are. We are the people seen and loved, all of us. As you know, Martin Luther King Jr. never left anyone outside his heart, not even those who jailed and tortured him. We are people worthy of generosity, passionate advocacy, abiding loyalty and love. We are rich enough to offer these things to others. We have only spirit of which Martin is such a radiant part to guide us. But that is as it should be. Spirit is our country because it is ultimately our only home. Let this awareness take some of the fear out of us. Here are two more poems to help us on our way into what will no doubt be a particularly dark and scary time. The first one is called When We Let Spirit Lead Us. <clears throat> when we let spirit lead us, it is impossible to know where we are being led. All we know, all we can believe, all we can hope is that we are going home. That wherever spirit takes us is where we live. And the second poem is called Remember. Remember, nothing is ever lost. It is only misplaced. If we look, we can find it again. <clears throat> Human kindness. Questions? Yes? What? I think I can just ask them. Do you have questions? <laughs> Answers?
uh, begin by making friends with the world and making friends with the people of the world. Um, for me, I was very fortunate that very summer after I was a fresh person in college, I was in the Soviet Union. And I was in the Soviet Union because even at 18 and 19, it just seemed ridiculous to me that my country was thinking of bombing a place where there were children and women and horses and dogs and, you know, people and things. And how could this be, how could this make sense? Uh, so that has been a guiding feeling uh, in me from the time I was very small, you know, just that, you know, we're one, we're one, and also that children, if I feel it, if Amber feels pain, someone your size and who, who is in another country, another part of the earth also feels pain, has the same emotions, the same suffering, um, and just, you know, know that that's the reality. And then uh, work very hard not to cause suffering uh, for other people. I have a story about James Baldwin. Um, we did meet, we did not. Uh, and what happened was, after The Color Purple came out, and I, I was just being threatened, you know, just attacked a lot. Uh, and at some point it got really tiring and it got really um, painful, and so I just retreated. And at that same time, Baldwin was coming to San Francisco where I lived. And he was going to be make, he was going to make an address, and his one request was that I introduce him. Uh, and I just could not do it. I just it was just like I was just wiped out. Um, and so the next thing I, he came and he made his address, and then the next thing that I heard was that he had died. And so I. Uh, you know, love him dearly, consider him my, my brother, my uncle, my friend. Um, his writing meant the world to me, as did his very being, his, his uh, insistent courage, uh, his wisdom, his grace, you know. So I wish we had met, and yet I feel on some level <clears throat> that when we truly love people, we are inseparable. And so he is in my heart. And wherever his spirit is, I am a part of his spirit. And this is what he recognized. I think that's why he wanted me to introduce him in San Francisco, where he said, Seely and Shug came to voice. Well, uh, the shortcut way would be to say that I recently, over the last year or so, have a cat <laughs> that I am just completely devoted to. And this cat has all of the, you know, grace, intelligence, uh, just, she's just amazing. And also my dog, I've had a dog for 11 years. She's an old lab now. Um, but I know just by living with them that they are just totally present, sentient, loving, cantankerous sometimes beings. Uh, and again, it's, it's like what I was saying to Amber, that part of what happens to us is that we develop empathy, that we really make that a priority. Uh, and a good way to do that, I think, is again uh, through meditation, beginning to sit with yourself and feel your own feelings and reach out in your feelings to the world and connect with people and animals. So, um, it's a tricky thing, though, because I have to say that sometimes I eat meat, 
And I say that because it feels hypocritical in a way if you eat meat that uh, you also have this feeling about animals. But I do it very uh, minimally, and I try to um, consume, for instance, chicken, which, you know, as a southerner, it's been so hard for me <laughs> not to eat chicken. Um, but what I do is I acknowledge that, you know, that this is a long part of my heritage and tradition that I can still hear my mother saying, you know, honey, go out there and catch, you know, Susie, you know, because our chickens had names. And, uh, you know, and, and, and bring her neck and fix, you know, pick and pull her feathers. I mean, so I did this, you know. Um, and so I have a real connection to that whole part of, of uh, animal life. We, we slaughter animals for, for food in the winter. Uh, and what the difference was, it seemed to me, was that they were really part of our whole uh, system, our whole little household, uh, and that it was out of necessity and it was, with, it was done with respect, and nobody enjoyed it, and nobody spaced out over it either. We all knew what was happening and that we had to do it to get through the winter, um, and, and that we had lived with them. We had lived with all of these creatures. So as an adult, uh, I am very connected to uh, PETA, you know, to, to animal rights groups, and I wrote a letter recently, well, a couple of years ago, to the head of Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, because the way that they do chicken, you know that slogan they have, we do chickens right? Well, if you believe that, you'll believe that America has done black people right. <laughs> they have done chicken just terribly. <laughs> and this is a place where we can really make a difference because we go there and we mindlessly eat this fried chicken, which is not good for us either. But the, the mistreatment of these creatures means that we have to stand up for them. We have to speak for them. So that is how I, I live, you know, trying to, to minimize the, the dependence on animal flesh. I mean, very, very small, but also at the same time staying connected so that I can speak and, and be aware of how they are being treated. You know, so they're in California, I don't know about here, but there's a Nyman uh, Ranch uh, pork and beef and stuff where they actually treat animals in a decent way. Um, and this is important. It is important because when you take in the, the fear and the, and the anger of animals, you just make yourself sick. Yes. Good evening, Paul. Hi. Hi. Um, as a writer, I know sometimes I sit down and write because it's something I feel like I have to say for me. Mm -hmm. And then other times I feel like maybe you hear this, but let's just not be stupid. So I'm wondering where the inspiration for this book came from. Why did you feel that it had to be written? And what do you hope to do with it once we absorb it? Okay. Um, well, it just happens that the woman who really helped me a lot, uh, Ina, where are you? Um, anyway, looks like she stepped out, but, oh, there you are. Well, I, we worked on this book uh, back and forth because Ina pointed out that it was very meditative uh, as publish, publicist and editor at uh, New Press. Uh, and it made me actually go much deeper into each of the pieces and to write an actual meditation at the end of each talk or each essay. And that's because we are in, now, I know that many of us feel really happy about the elections. We feel that we got the Democrats back in office, got the House, uh, and that's all very wonderful. But it is by no means any more than just the bare beginning of what we have to do. The task before humans is so big and the time is still so dark that when we look at political situations in the world, we actually need to have a space to sit back, to pause, and to meditate on things rather than trying to move forward instantly, which is so much what this culture teaches us, speed. And so that is why the book is structured the way that it is, that there are meditations that we can actually sit with. And there are ways uh, shared in it uh, to teach children how to adore the earth, how to adore the planet. 
And one of the ways that you can easily teach children how to adore the planet is by sitting with them as they eat something off of a tree that they pick themselves and they very slowly help them grasp the wonder, for instance, of a peach. If you can get a child to really see what a miracle we live in, you will have a child who can defend the planet. But if they never get that, they don't know what they're defending. Hi, Alison Chen. Hi. I want to ask you real quick, uh, what resonates most for me when I listen to your book and you speak is that you have a uncanny predictable faculty. And I want to be profound. It's as if they're not even here. I mean, they're connected to some weird thing so that nobody's anywhere. You know, and they're watching something that's not where they are. And when do you have your life? If you don't have your life, and you're giving your life over to, you know, some fake thing. I mean, I've been on enough TV to see that what we To me, actually, TV is like looking into an open coffin. I mean, that's, you know, people all made up, you know, it's all, it's not real. And when you, when you actually see how it's done, you see that. But many people think that that is realer than what they have. And I say, no. What you have, even if it's, you know, poor, even if it's, you know, little, even if it's whatever it is, is yours. And you are here to have that and to express that and to be with that and to enjoy your life. So I live now for, you know, I think in my life, it seems to me, I have lived enough already for like 12 people. <laughs> and it's just been fabulous. So that's, that's it, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also, you know, it's not like, you know, this fabulous thing, it's not like that's what you have all the time. Somehow you fall completely off the edge and under the floor. But that's also a part of the miracle of being here. And that's where you really understand that you are just sitting in heaven. This is heaven. Earth is actually heaven. We're in heaven. And I feel that. I have no desire to go anywhere else. <laughs> yes. Okay, this question I has to do with awakening the giant within. I am a wood being trying to take a ride of pressure control, trying to follow in the footsteps of my idol as a little girl growing up in the projects, and I never could make it out. And I found my flower with the words of my idol. Such is what I told my daughter. Now at 41 years of age, I can finally pursuing my dream of becoming a writer. So what do you tell us would-be writers in reference to awakening the giant with us and building our confidence, building our courage and our faith? Are you saying awakening the giant within you? Within, to keep pursuing your dream and putting those words on paper so that you're not so concerned with what you're writing mm -hmm. Okay, well, first of all, don't live where you're afraid to go outside. Outside is important. You have to be outside. I mean, you have to sell all your clothes or, you know, members of the family, but, you know, but get out of there. You know, don't stay, don't stay, um, don't stay there. Are you staying there? Are you there where you're afraid to go outside? Oh, those, I see. And that was a terrible joke, and I'm very sorry about the members of the family thing. But I'm just saying, you know, it's very, it's very, very important to be where your spirit can grow. Because if you put yourself in that place, and especially with lots of nature around you, you will tell yourself, you won't really need idols. You know, I'm not an idol, by the way. I, I'm totally not. I mean, I have clay feet up to my neck. So, you know, it just, it, it's not good to look so much at other people. But look inside you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. I'm Flora. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for being here. And thank you for your wisdom. Mm -hmm. I have actually uh, two questions, one short and the other one a little bit longer. The first has to do with women and poor women. Uh, I understand uh, there are statistics that say that the great majority of women who are poor live on less than $2 a day yes. in the world. And a couple of years ago, Bill Cosby began a uh, tirade in America with some remarks that he made that basically uh, involves uh, poor women, poor black women. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you might share your wisdom about the things that he has said and some of the criticisms of what he has said and perhaps uh, 
you know, I would have to know exactly what he said, exactly what he said, not hearsay. Um, because, you know, just my impression of what he said was that he was really trying to talk straight to us, you know, about really doing better than we're doing. Now, I may be wrong, but that was my impression. Um, and I think that there is some truth in that. I think that there is a need to, um, you know, just refuse any excuses by now, you know? I mean, just, just really understand that we have to be educated. We cannot function in this society without education. Uh, we, we have to, you know, circle the wagon where the drug situation is concerned. I don't know how that's going to happen, but it seems to me that as a community of people, we should be able to figure it out. I mean, shouldn't we? Yeah. So, so I, think, I think that what I kind of heard out of one ear was something to do with just kind of getting down to it and understanding that nobody's going to change this but us. And, and you know, just, just start. Yes. Well, I, I, you know, I don't know. I would have to go and research it before I feel like I could, you know, really speak on, on that. Yeah. But part of our tradition as black people is that we do help each other, and we always look um, to help people who don't have as much as we have. That has been our tradition since we got here. And if we lose that, that's a very big loss. Yes. <coughs> I'm Roger. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Sean Cloud. I'm from New York County. Um, and I wanted to ask you sort of a personal question about your writing process. Um, I just kind of would be interested to know what it's like for you when you sit down to the page, whether or not, um, you know, whether or not you listen to music or whether or not, whether or not you use a computer or whether or not you use a typewriter or whether or not you write by hand. Um, <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> 